Um, first of all, let me uh, thank so that's you. A, that's a tool to not interrupt you. Yeah, I'm sorry. That, no yeah, that's right. They can't interrupt <laughs> until we hand that out. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, confess to you that I'm having trouble speaking, so I'm going to be drinking coffee during the presentation, and at some point I'll need to get rid of it. But uh, <laughs> I'll do the best I can for as long as I can. Let me start out by pointing a few things out to you. Uh, the, uh, the audience should know. Um, <clears throat> this is not my topic, it's not my, my uh, area of expertise. So um, at best, I'm going to try to ask questions and hope that I will learn from you as opposed to the other way around. I found that by asking naive questions, sometimes you learn a lot. Now, in order to make this actually work uh, on an interactive basis, uh, I have to tell you, I'm hearing impaired. I wear two hearing aids. I'm 65 dB down. Uh, those of you who are in the plenary presentation will know that I asked everybody to use this little microphone with an FM transmitter in it. So when we get to um, a time very quickly, when this turns into a discussion, uh, I'm going to ask that, uh, that those of you who want to say something, please use the microphone and this little transmitter. Otherwise, I won't be able to hear your questions. And even if I couldn't answer them anyway, I would like to know what the questions were. So let me start out <clears throat> by reminding you that there are a lot of very conventional uh, mechanisms that are associated with parallelism multiple instruction streams with multiple data, single instruction streams with multiple data, pipelines, and those have all been mentioned in some ways or another already. Uh, in our world at Google, MapReduce turned out to be an incredibly important mechanism for making use of parallel computation um, in order to uh, uh, speed up and to reduce latency uh, in the uh, searching of a very large uh, index of the World Wide Web, for example. Uh, and then there's sort of natural parallelism that happens in cryptanalysis, for example. You can hand out <clears throat> a cryptographic, an encrypted string to a large number of processors and tell each one to explore by brute force a particular portion of the key space. That's a very natural decomposition uh, into parallel operation. Or in the case of, of our clouds at Google, where we have a large number of users doing different things, some of them are doing searches, some of them are editing documents, some of them are doing email. It doesn't matter what they're doing, what matters is it's a large number of them doing it. And so we have a large number of processors that will do something for uh, each of those parties. We distribute the computation that's required in order to satisfy each of those users. Uh, and, and by that means take advantage of the natural parallelism that each user brings to the problem. Each person wants his own particular problem to be solved. I think for some kinds of applications, the biggest issue that I uh, think about is moving uh, intermediate results from one processor to another. A good example of this would be weather simulations where you have uh, voxels of volume and you're trying to compute some weather components inside of each volume. As you um, run this uh, com computation, <clears throat> intermediate data has to get to the adjacent voxels. And if you've lodged the voxel computation in one particular machine or a particular processor in a multi-core system, you have to figure out how to move that data promptly and quickly in order to keep the computation going. And that turns out to, to pose a fairly severe problem. And just to go back into antediluvian history, some of you probably studied uh, the early uh, designs of parallel machines, the Iliac IV was one that I got introduced to fairly early in my career. Uh, this thing had a, an enormous number of processors, 64 of them. <clears throat> but when you keep in mind it was built around 1974, each processor was about this big, and <clears throat> it had a big hole in the middle. It was a D-shaped uh, piece of uh, technology. The hole in the middle was for wind to blow through to cool the thing off. Um, it had a, a 1024-bit wide uh, data bus, but the thing that was the most bizarre about it is that because the processors were interconnected in a particular way, 
in order to make use of them in parallel, you had to install the information, the, the starting state of the computation had to be put in place in a very skewed way across each of the processors so that after each cycle of computation, the, the data that was produced in that cycle could be handed to the next processor at the appropriate time and in the appropriate physical place. Uh, so there was a huge amount of setup to take advantage of, of the parallelism in that machine. It also had a mean time between failure of about 30 minutes or so. <laughs> Um, but Dan Slotnick, the guy that designed the machine, used to say, hey, you can do a lot of computation in that 30 minutes. So, you know, <laughs> what, and your point was? Um, and the programming language was some very obscure thing called Glipnir, which I always thought sounded like some sort of small dinosaur. Um, it wasn't widely uh, known. So these are, are all tactics which I'm sure every one of you is very familiar with. I think the point I want to make in this slide is that um, problems par that could be attacked in parallel don't, have the, don't all have the same properties. <clears throat> and so these tactics will apply to one kind of computation but not necessarily to another. So anyone who thought that you could come away from this workshop uh, with the idea that a particular design would solve all parallelization problems should not come away with that thought. You should disabuse yourself of that. Some computations and some uh, applications will work well in some designs and not so well in others. Um, so he here's where I get into the highly naive and very speculative territory about which I know almost nothing. And you can figure that much out just by reading these questions. <clears throat> so one speculation I have, and I'd like to get your um, feedback on this, so we have the microphone there, yes. and I'm going to turn this on. Okay, this has side effects on my, there. My hearing aids have just automatically turned off. This is weird. <laughs> okay, that's on. It's a green light. This is, this is the FM transmitter. This is an FM receiver. And there's a Bluetooth system inside my hearing aids. <laughs> I'm a, a walking demonstration of the importance of batteries and high tech. Okay, so <clears throat> in theory, if, if uh, you want to respond, uh, you use both of these gadgets, we'll both hear. Um, so with regard to multi-core chips, I have the naive belief that putting more processing power on a chip doesn't do much for you unless you can get data in and out of the chip fast enough or get it back and forth between the cores. And my impression right now is that that is proven to be a big problem. There's a hand up over there. Who's got the microphone? You've got it, okay. Our previous speaker, so he's getting even with me for asking questions. Good for you. Just got a hold of my end of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, so when I first started, with this stuff. Uh, it, it, they weren't quite as expensive as the ILAC 4, but these things were, you know, I remember walking across the parking lot with five CPU boards and carrying three times the price of my health in my arm. It was a BFM. It was a big machine, right? Yes. So you wanted to make sure you used all of what you already had. Uh, today, these things are really, really cheap. <clears throat> and so perhaps we go more towards a model of a Swiss Army knife, where you have you know, you're supposed to only knife, you never do use all the blades all at once. Uh, maybe somebody has, but I've never seen anybody do it successfully. They don't have any fingers left. But no. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, so the thing is, there's a lot of special purpose things you can mm -hmm. throw some transistors on to do. And perhaps they're only used 1% of the time, but if that contributes the workload, and then you aren't, they don't necessarily need as much I.O. That might be an alternative <clears throat> approach. So uh, wait, let's stay with, on this topic for just a second. Um, yes, now the second to the last bullet. Uh, I've been reading, you know, just sort of almost by accident, uh, comments about floating point, uh, not floating point, uh, uh, field programmable uh, gate arrays and their utility uh, in parallel processing. Can you speak to that? Because it sounds a little bit like the Swiss Army knife observation, except in this case, you keep changing the blade. Yeah, um, I, guess, I guess if you have a, a machine shop, you could do that with a real Swiss Army knife. Uh, but. Um, the place where it's been the most effective has been in Embedded because you have these little MP MP3 players mm -hmm. and the CPU may light up every few minutes because the rest of the time it's just having hardware accelerated, pulling from memory, running through some uh, 
MP3 decoders and then in, out into the hardware. Uh, and we haven't had quite that, I'm not sure why, but that sort of programming approach hasn't made it as much to the servers or the desktop class. My, my guess, my, my, the easy answer is, well, because their general purpose, they do so many things that it's harder to come up with a piece of hardware that's going to be worth its weight. Uh, but they are using them in, uh, uh, I hear that the, uh, the our, our friends on Wall Street use it to uh, potentially collapse our economy much faster, as John Corbett put it many years ago. <laughs> Terrific. Well, really uh, just a serious me. comment after yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, there is a talk about uh, multi-core versus FPGAs at yeah. mid-afternoon, so... Ah, okay. ...that you will miss. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, let me, let me uh, go on to, with this business about uh, moving data around in the system. Uh, leads me to ask again about how we connect things together. And one of the things that we haven't, uh, I don't think, successfully exploited yet is optical interconnects. We can, we can do it in a very crude way by connecting a, a, maybe a motherboard to a bunch of other machines using optical uh, fiber. But I wonder about free space optics. There was a time uh, when I was at DARPA uh, where some speculation was made that we should build a set of processors that were on the inside of a sphere so that they could all see each other. And the idea was that you could spurt data back and forth among the various processors using free space optics. It has the nice fact, um, uh, it takes advantage of the, of the property that light doesn't interfere. And so you could be transmitting simultaneously without having any uh, interference. So could I ask whether uh, there is currently known to you uh, any activity involving use of optical communication to improve our ability to move data around in a parallel system. I'm not seeing any hands going up. So maybe, yes, here we go again. Yep. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a real challenge. I apologize for making this so hard. <clears throat> God, what broke? Sorry, it's a lot of, a lot of hassle for not very much comment. Um, I saw something at a HP presentation from HP Research in 2008 or 2009. And they were just um, experimenting with um, replacing the bus in a, in a computer system with optics. And they were using um, loops of fiber optics, mm. using uh, interference loop to, to get the data. But, but that was a more or less conventional fiber optic interconnect, is that right? Yes, it wasn't free space optics. Okay. Uh, what about on-chip optics as opposed to, uh, is, that, is that included in, in the design? On the chip, no. Okay, so this is inter-chip inter or inter-board uh, communications, okay. And uh, you had a comment also, I think. I guess is that waveguides or fibers will be needed just because otherwise the energy density is going to be painful, be my guess. I might be wrong about that, but... Okay, so there, we're down in a space where I have not enough intuition to have an opinion. Um, uh, the hell no. uh, I, I'm sorry, is there another comment? Yep. I'm sorry that this is making it harder for you to do, but it's sure helping me, so I appreciate that. Um, I think with optics, one of the main benefits... No, it's okay. We're, oh, you're, I, think I can hear you, but is the microphone working too? Yeah, yeah okay. I, I think with the optics, one of the main benefits is for the chip layout, because you can have um, sort of optics going through each other, whereas... Oh, uh, yes, exactly. Okay. You, you, so the, literally, the, you don't have uh, metal, metalization that's crossing, which yeah. you have to separate and everything else. Yeah, Good they point. Just go straight through Good each point. other. Well, it'll be interesting to see whether that actually gets taken advantage of. If we ever go beyond silicon to uh, things like diamond substrates and so on, we may find uh, other interesting uh, possibilities. I want to, to uh, these are not in any particular order. Um, I would guess that men, most of you probably have not been inside a Google data center. Has anybody here actually been inside of one? We have a few people from Google, perhaps, or Spy is one of the two. Um, <laughs> uh, as, a, as a software guy, uh, I don't usually think much about the hardware that it takes to do large-scale computation. 
Of course, I'm always impressed when I see things like the crane machines and the connection machine and some of the other, you know, beautifully uh, crafted things. But the scale of uh, a Google data center is utterly mind-boggling. Some of them are 400,000 square feet. They take 128 megawatts of backup power. You have to cool the damn thing off. You know, I tried to get them to put pizza ovens in the top of the racks, and I figured we'd get double duty out of that, but uh, they said the cheese drops down into the circuit board. <laughs> Bad idea. Uh, you, you, uh, you are, uh, I was anyway, completely stunned by this, just the physical scale of this thing. And my first reaction, since there are wires all over everywhere, was I'm thinking, my God, how does anybody keep straight that the data gets from where it's supposed to go to where, you know, or where it is where it's supposed to go? However, if you were to step back and look at the way the systems are built, what you see is memory and processing integrated together. Each circuit board has local cache, it has RAM, it has terabytes, sometimes many, uh, of uh, disk capability on each board. And of course the boards are all stacked up and there's optical interconnects everywhere running at 40 gigabits a second or more. So in a very funny way, it, it's an architecture which is mixing together memory and processing adjacent to each other. So one of the questions uh, I wonder about is whether we should be exploring more ways on a smaller scale of joining processing and memory together, uh, in, in a sense taking advantage in the same way we do in the Google data centers, but on a smaller chip, uh, chip size scale. There's a comment. Uh, this is one of the places where FPGAs do take the win because they have this distributed memory. So you have computation and memory at a bit level right next to each other, distributed spatially in a massive array across the chip. So if you can make use of that through uh, sort of physical structure of the computation, then that's, you know, that's, that's why for the appropriate design an FPGA will wipe the floor every day with a CPU. Um, but then that's, that's one of the elements. It just, it, it happens at a bit level rather than at a CPU, gigabyte memory, terabyte hard drive. Got scale. it. Thank you for that. So, you know, oh yes, please go ahead. Yeah, one of, one of the uh, ways where it is actually done on the CPU level is when um, the Erlang guys started to um, rewrite the Erlang engine to run on multiple CPUs, they try to come up with a scheduler that makes sure that a process, an Erlang process is always staying on the same CPU, having the data in the same CPU cache okay. without the need to actually ship, ship off data between CPUs and so on, so that you get around those limitations. So just on that score, uh, I did have uh, a small uh, exposure to one of the scheduling problems that we have in the data center, and that's figuring out for this particular query or this particular email uh, interaction, which machine should this run on? And clearly, uh, when you have a fairly large chunk of data that uh, the user is working with, like maybe your Gmail, um, it's important that that particular uh, interaction uh, occur on the place where the data is already located. So there were a number of algorithms that were ex uh, explored experimentally for scheduling and, and distribution of uh, computers to uh, at the application. And I was quite surprised to learn that first fit turned out to be the most effective algorithm. I mean, it's the simplest one, it's the first one you think of, and you think, well, that can't be the right answer because it's too easy. And no, there is such a thing as being overly sophisticated. So that's how we ended up with our scheduling algorithm. Yes, sir. A question. Have you, are you aware of any algorithm that has been written with the purpose of saving power? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, so the, answer, the answer is yes, but not in the context that you're, you, you intended the question. There have been a number of algorithms related to mobiles, for example, to try to reduce power uh, for transmission in order to save battery power. But I love the question because the idea of dealing, um, dealing with computational power consumption is for us a big deal. Anything that would reduce the amount of power required to run a data center would be of great value to us. And um, I don't know that we've actually tried to do that. There's a hand way in the back. We're going to have to throw the whole shebang up there. How do we well, get it? While I go there, I just tell the story that it's not my from uh, Beckman, who is a 
director of the Argonne something lab in, in Chicago, and they have this computational problem that they just uh, need to switch off the, the machines in, in summer. Yeah, I just wanted to say, this isn't my research, but there's definitely a research group at ANU that's working on this kind of stuff. They've got heavily instrumented machines, and they'll run multiple implementations of a problem, and they can tell you, you know, to the milliwatt, how much the CPU drew during the calculation. And I'm sure there's other research groups doing this stuff too. I know that uh, there are more gross efforts at reducing power requirements by turning various parts of a chip or parts of a circuit board off that uh, appear not to be needed. You know, the big issue there is what happens when you need them, how long does it take to turn them back on. Uh, somewhere in here, I had, yes, memristors, I wanted to mention this. Now, this is a, a technology about which I do not know much, but my impression is like the FPGAs, they have the possibility of simultaneously using the same um, basic physics to both uh, remember something and also to compute with it. The consequence of that is exactly the point about um, uh, coalescing the computing power and memory. And the nice thing about the memristor is that it doesn't require any power to remember the information that it has in it. And so you have effects like instant on and a few other things. That might contribute to power reduction because you don't need power in order to maintain the information in the system. Mm -hmm. Yes, where's yeah, the next uh, one? I just wanted to say that uh, our group is working on power management and power reduction within multi-core. And one, one, one promising approach is heterogeneous multi-core systems where you've got low-powered processors okay. and high-powered processors. You turn all the high-powered processors off when you don't need them. And when the low-powered processors start overloading, you then fire up the other yes. ones migrate the processors. <clears throat> and we're exploring that with the Panda board at the moment, which has got uh, A9 and M3 um, processors all on the same chip. And so, so, far. so now an interesting question is whether the FPGA could be used in a way that would allow it to configure itself to be the high power or the low power thing depending on what you needed or is it the basic implementation is going to consume whatever power and that's it? Uh, I, 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 I can't know. speak to FPGAs but I do know that uh, manufacturers are now putting low powered and high powered cores on the same substrate. On the same chip. So, you know, this, if you don't mind this ancient dinosaur going back into ancient history again, um, <clears throat> my thesis advisor at UCLA was a man named Gerald Estrin. And in the 1950s, this is a really long time ago, he started working on something called a fixed plus plus variable processor. They had a digital processor and they had an analog processor. And the analog processor ran faster than the digital processor in terms of getting solutions, except for the fact that it didn't get very many digits of accuracy. So the idea was to use the variable uh, function, the analog function, to get a starting point to feed the digital one. Now, this is in 1955 or 56. And what occurs to me is that there's some uh, s sort of some similarity to this idea of having higher power and low power or mixed heterogeneous elements in a common uh, chipset. Uh, I, so are, is your, are your results being published? Uh, he's, yes, they will be. Great. OK. Are there other comments, or we keep going? OK. Um, now, some of you, if you're like me, you know, I'm a big science fiction fan, and I love to talk about or at least read about uh, quantum communications and uh, teleportation and all this other stuff. Uh, but there is something going on in uh, entanglement which continues to be very puzzling. We all know about this spooky uh, interaction at a distance, and Einstein didn't like it at all. Um, my impression is that we, we keep hearing more and more ways in which entangled uh, particles or entangled elements um, can influence each other regardless of how far apart they are. And this, this makes me wonder whether there's something going on in the physics down at the quantum level um, that we could take advantage of somehow. If it's true, if you look at um, uh, string theory, for example, and the models of uh, physics through the string theoretic uh, view, you get something like 11 dimensions and a lot of symmetry. It's conceivable that some of these effects, which are dem demonstrable, are taking place through dimensions which are not the four that we're familiar with, the space-time uh, notion that Einstein used uh, for his theory. 
uh, these are, they say, well, we can't see those dimensions because they're all very tiny and they're all wrapped up. But it would be interesting if it were actually the case that these entanglement effects are propagated not through the normal uh, space-time dimensions, but through these other dimensions, if they exist. If we could possibly take advantage of that, we could conceivably allow communication uh, over physical, substantial physical distances. So we could build a larger and larger scale computing engine which doesn't suffer from speed of light delay. And any of you who design machines that are up against the propagation speed of uh, electricity or electrons uh, in a wire uh, or in an optical, op of photons in an optical fiber will know that that's a severe limitation. And if we can get past that, it would make a big difference. Yes, sir? Um, as for faster than light uh, communication of information, um, it's not, uh, current state of physics is that it's not possible. Um, we do have uh, systems where you can uh, split two quant uh, entangled bits um, and collapse one of them and the other one is guaranteed to collapse in the opposite direction, but you can't actually get the information out until you compare so, the two uh, ends via a normal channel. Yeah, I notice you're wearing an interesting equation there. Which one is it? <laughs> um, the, let, me, let me only arm wrestle, wrestle with you a little bit because I actually uh, understand and, and heard the same thing. The only reason that I raise this as a not so totally crazy idea is that uh, there's still some peculiar evidence in the theory behind quantum computing uh, that the reason there's a quantum speed up is that some of the results are coming from the future. In other words, that this, this notion of, of present, past, and future, uh, remember, I'm not a physicist, so I'm struggling with this, but the idea that, that all three of these states are interacting with each other and that some information is actually appear, apparently coming from the future suggests that we may actually get to the point where we can force state. This, your point is you can't force the state of an entangled particle in order to cause the other guy to take on a certain value. And if we could get there, of course, then we would have faster than light communication. There still is a problem. I mean, you have to create the entanglement. You have to move the in, half of the entangled particles to the other place physically before you can take advantage of that. And so you still have a speed of light delay in order to get the system set up. Um, I agree with you, we don't have strong evidence at this point, but I've seen some really surprising results where it's been possible to teleport, that is to say reproduce, the state of a particular particle by using three of them in a series of, of transactions. Uh, it, in, in effect, it causes a particular electron to be propagated from here to there. What's really happened is its state has been propagated from here to there. Remember, all electrons are indistinguishable except for their spin state. So, <clears throat> so teleportation really means recreation of this electron in some other place with the same state. So I don't, you know, I'm, I'm waving my hands like crazy here, but it's yeah. <laughs> it's, I, fun, it's fun to imagine that we might actually to build something like that. We, we can teleport in the sense that we can recreate the state somewhere yeah. else, but um, as for doing that faster than light. Yeah, that's an issue. That's an issue. Okay. Well, surely you're going to solve that problem for us, right? I mean, somebody has to do that. Okay, yes, yeah, so we'll get you next. Uh, no, no, wait a minute. I have him back here and then we'll get it. Yes, sir. Uh, just out of interest, there is actually a patent granted by the Australian Patent Office on superluminal communication. Um, <laughs> and and, and then this, did this go to Buck Rogers or something? Well, no, I, uh, it was a guy who wears tinfoil hats and, um, yeah. It, it, Crazy dude, <laughs> rocked, up, rocked up and gave a presentation at a group I'm part of. <clears throat> and, yeah, part of his evidence for superluminal communication being possible is that he, he has a patent on it. Oh, I see. So <laughs> it, it must be true. A certain circularity there, right? <laughs> okay, we have one down here. Yes, sir. Well, this is uh, another humorous circular comment. Uh, Google could uh, end up using data centers in the future before they built them. God, wouldn't, that would be really, my head hurts. I'm waiting for the answer. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know, now if we could figure out how to do that and get somebody else to pay for them, that would be wonderful. I mean, it would do wonders for our business model. Yes, sir. 
not sure that I, I understand all the physics behind... I don't either, so um, don't worry about it. Taking, taking, having two particles and having, being able to collapse one and, the, and as you said, the, state, the speed of light means you can only move that particle. You just start a stream of particles off and they're received at the receiving end stored and when you need to send information yep. you collapse the, the, yes. the ones you know, you've sent earlier. That's, that's the theory. The, the problem of course is that <clears throat> um, you do have a speed of light limitation if you physically have to move the particles to the place where they're going to get used. Uh, I've been dying to find some solution to the FTL problem because every time I look at uh, inter, uh, uh, interplanetary communication, which is already hard enough, I'm now starting to work on an interstellar mission. And a part of the problem is that at current uh, speeds, we only deliver an object to another star, even a nearby one, in about 50,000 years. It's kind of a long time, to, considering you know, human society hasn't existed more than a fifth of that. So the, the next question is whether it's, uh, we can get anything that would go faster than that. And can we deliver them in like 100 years? Um, or, or 40 years or something, even to the nearest star, like Alpha Centauri. Uh, if, but if we could deliver entangled particles in, let's say, a 40-year period at a tenth the speed of light, then we could use this kind of, uh, if we had the ability to actually force the state of those particles, we could use this quantum communication to make it work. That's all kind of speculative. Uh, Vint, yes. here, uh, leaving high with, um, how is your interplanetary corporation doing these days? Uh, well, actually, it's doing, uh, we are well along in establishing standards for interplanetary communication. The consultative, I think I mentioned in my plenary remarks, the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which standardizes communication for spacecraft, uh, is already considering uh, the adoption and use of these uh, interplanetary protocols for standards purposes, and if we get that all done by the end of, let's say, 2011, um, we uh, have a, a shot at having at least the wherewithal to expect um, interoperability among all the various spacecraft that are being built. And that's a very exciting prospect because we can repurpose them to be part of a, uh, of a network. Yes, I see a, a question um, over there. Yes, sir. With the entangled particles, uh, now I'm not a physicist, but I do know information theory, and the, just the fact that the entangled particles has collapsed is itself information. But if you've got two particles and you can collapse one and then the other in a particular time interval, well, that is information. You may not have to worry about the state. Oh, great, we're going to have a fight. <laughs> By the way, I, before you answer, I have to tell you, in this conversation, how many times have you heard the, I am not a lawyer, now it's just, I am not a physicist is the I, new thing. I, Go. I actually am a physicist. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> um, you, when you read the particle, like when you find out it's state, you can't tell whether the other end has collapsed it or not. You only see spin up, spin down. So I look at the particle, I see it spin up. And once I've read that, then the other, I know that the other electron must be spinned down, but I don't know if they've collapsed it yet or not. No. no. You know, I don't know what's the matter with you physicists. You ought to be able to make this stuff work. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we done enough? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, well, do you have other slides, a part of the physics one? I have, I have, yeah, no, actually I have, I have some other slides, but I wanted to ask about graphics processing uh, units. Some people apparently have used GPUs as a way of, because they're very super speed, they, they do all this rendering uh, very, very rapidly. Some people have been able to uh, literally uh, subvert the purpose of the GPU into doing computations. Uh, you have to do crazy things like expressing the problem in very peculiar forms, like you know which color is this answer. Uh, I haven't ever, I haven't ever actually jumped into the middle of all that, so I don't know all the weirdness. But I thought maybe some of you may have had the experience of taking GPUs and turning them into a, a multi-processing system, and you could tell us about that. So I see the physicist over there, and the, you're not. I don't know. You've, yeah, you go for it. 
you don't actually have to subvert them anymore. All of the state-of-the-art GPUs are general purpose, um, single instruction, multi-data machines that just happen to have firmware seen off to the side to do all of the various um, three-space trig that you need to do. Um, it's very easy to play with now. Um, you can go to Amazon Web Services and for $16.80 US, you can buy one trillion floating point operations in a GPU. I have been known to pay more for a pot of tea. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's one way back there. This is starting to sound really cool. <laughs> but what is, what have, have you actually done that and what, what kind of computation were you doing? I'm sorry, maybe you can't tell us, but... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear a thing because he's got the microphone. Okay, we have here. <laughs> yes, so uh, as now the um, speaker was saying, yes, you, you, there is lots of uh, OpenCL, um, there's CUDA, there's a lot of languages for talking these things, and they're getting better. All sorts of stuff all the time. But the big problem with GPUs at the moment still I.O. Um, yeah, as soon as right. you've got to go and try and fetch data that's not actually stored on the GPU. Uh, I'm, I'm reading a paper. Uh, one of the guys was doing make sure you had all that data as close as you can get it because uh, general, pers uh, general purpose CPUs are still doing better in the case where they've got to go and fetch from main memory because the GPUs still aren't designed to do that efficiently. Okay, thank you. One more comment from our physicist here. Resident, you now have the title resident physicist, I think. Has anyone else before that? <laughs> you know, Mr. Chairman, I apologize for making you run all over I the building we here. Have this is the last time you'll ever have a deaf the, guy come and talk. No, the, the point of the whole mini-conf is not yeah. to think what we have been doing, because there is a lot of history here, but start to think about what can be done. So, Fair enough. off to the physicist. <laughs> Um, this answer is not actually going to be physics related, but oh, good. Um, All right. <laughs> one of the um, other problems that you have with GPUs is that they're only really good for highly hom homogeneous problems. Okay. Because um, every core has to take the same branches, and the way they do it is just by turning off the cores if they're currently executing a branch which they're not supposed to be in. Okay, so that means the set of problems to which you can apply this is going to be uh, constrained by that. What happened? Well, this is like the hot dog. They didn't make it all right. Um, my name is Matt. I do uh, weather simulation, aerodynamic simulation for foreign government using clusters of GPU devices. And the real challenge, we work with numerous algorithms, and the real problem is uh, changing the original algorithm to operate efficiently on the GPU device. So you can't just take any algorithm and throw it on. It's just okay. not going to work. So you have to take into account the hardware when you design the algorithm. So using that, we're able to get performance 2,000, 2,500 times faster than on wow. a normal CPU cluster. Wow. And the foreign government I work for is not that big. We don't have a lot of money. So that's why we use it. You know, the rest of us are going to be very curious to find out which foreign government you're working for. <laughs> and what are they doing with all that processing power? Uh, just a comment about what we had on the previous meeting of about uh, heterogeneous mm -hmm. computing, about we have all these chips, but have different colors of chips. So that was a question that we discussed on the previous mini a year ago, and everyone is welcome to comment on that. And so Carson. if I could uh, just uh, reinforce the comment uh, that you made about um, the need to adapt the algorithm to the hardware, there's no question in my mind that a lot of the um, successes in parallelism have been rooted exactly in understanding the computational nature of the underlying hardware and the ability to rethink how to get to a particular computational result. And this uh, earlier comments that were made, you know, that you made, by the way, about um, uh, whether it's asynchrony or um, uh, commutativity, which we didn't get to talk too much about, or the possibility of approaching a computation through different paths, different sequences, is really important because if you can prove, or at least persuade yourself, that the computation is, uh, produces the same result, even if it goes through a different sequence of steps, uh, then you may actually be able to adapt to these special pieces of hardware. Who's got the, uh, there you are. Uh, no, no, who has it now? You do, okay, go. Um, 
getting back to the, the types of jobs that yes. you do and the AWS, there's a, a blog post, somebody's done a proof of concept of using an AWS compute node with the NVIDIA Fermi on it to um, brute force, uh, is it SHA1 or SHA256 passwords? And they've actually got a dollar cost for, yeah. for, for doing that. So if you have a budget, you can budget you know, I have a grand to spend on cr cracking these passwords. How many can I do? Uh, so the question now will measure password cracking in cups of tea. <laughs> I might just wave my FPGA flag again briefly. Um, one of the comments about, you know, the issues with GPUs is, well, we've got to structure our algorithms to, to fit these architectures. Mm -hmm. and. With, with lots of lots of conditions aside, again, that's one of the promises of custom computing machines is, well, you structure your architecture to fit the computation. As opposed to the so other you, way so around. So you turn it the other way around. And, and, and so, you know, some really simple examples of this, which also come back to the power consumption question that mm -hmm. was raised before, is when you have this, this flexible computing fabric, you can make a fast and large and high power architecture to solve a computation or you can make a small, slow, low power architecture to solve the same computation. And, and there's this sort of, this rule of thumb in the, in the research area, which is basically that the time area product is a, roughly a constant. So you can just kind of pick a point on that Pareto on that, curve on that, on that. Uh, within, you know, with a lot of, a lot of conditions as well. But anyway. I want to get, there we are. Okay, I'm noticing that we're going to run out of time in a little while, so. No, you won't. <laughs> so, so I had some additional hacks I want to talk about. Anyway, go ahead. Just, uh, I suppose my general thought on this, and I'd, um, I had been using, um, now I can't remember the name of the library for doing uh, parallel computation uh, for a number of years, and I had read a paper on how to do parallel sorting, which I'd always thought would be something that weird, would be incredibly, yeah. have to be incredibly <clears throat> linear, and in, in fact it works quite well, and, you know, what they used to use on data tapes. Uh, and thinking of, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the guy who runs id software, um, but John Carmack, um, his comment was, the hardest challenge that games designers now have to face is multi-core systems. They're used to having to do everything, but they have all of the resources of one CPU. Now, splitting that task up is actually the hard part. And I, I suspect we're going to see for specialised workloads, all of the, the uh, effort goes into making it easy to parallel lo parallelise those, and we're seeing all of the, the work going into that. But for our general workloads, people are still solving these things the wrong way because they've got the wrong tools at the software level. And it would be nice to have that whole layer there. Um, and I think that's, it's going to be all of those building blocks that are going together rather than just get the hardware right or get the firmware right and everything will fall, fall this, into place. This, so. this is, in some ways, this is not any different than getting an automobile engine to work. It's not a question of just putting gas in the gas tank. There are a whole bunch of other parameters that you have to make sure are properly configured and the thing works or otherwise it doesn't. I agree with that. Okay. Wouldn't be time to have different uh, operating system for each of these areas? I mean, the person has been talking about weather prediction that, or in order to simplify, I don't know. I don't, I don't know whether I would be persuaded that you need a different operating system. Uh, for that exactly. One, one extremely nimble straight will be a meta. Okay. What, well, let me, let me ask. Mm -hmm. We've already talked about the PlayStation related stuff, the, the GPU stuff. But what about things like uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence SETI at home? By the way, uh, just, just a side comment. Do you know why we're doing this search for extraterrestrial intelligence? It's because we didn't find any here, so we're looking at it. <laughs> um, the, one, the thing that's interesting about that proposition and the substrate that it runs on is that uh, it is taking the problem and distributing it to a very large number of uh, potential uh, players. And it works partly because it's naturally uh, parallel reception of a large amount of uh, frequencies. 
and the large number of processors that are waiting and will accept a certain amount of data. So it's a confined uh, search and uh, pattern detection problem. The same is true for protein folding. So that's a kind of parallelism that doesn't necessarily require very, very rapid interaction because the problem is patient in some sense. We're just doing pattern recognition. We don't have to do it instantaneously. Um, you've probably seen a similar way of using uh, people uh, as parts of a parallel processing system. Uh, we do a lot of work at Google in scanning uh, documents you know, for the, you know, this sort of thing for Google book search and often our algorithms don't uh, recognize some of the characters. Now uh, you'll know that in uh, some websites you don't get to put anything into it in unless you uh, uh, type a rather obscured uh, image of some words. So some people have put the deliberately obscured image plus the thing that we couldn't recognize. And as a user, you'd have to do both. And we figure if you get the deliberately obscured CAPTCHA correct, that you probably got the other string correct. And we use that to improve our character recognition. So we're using human beings as part of a parallel distributed processing system. Now, I don't, I hope nobody takes that the wrong way. I mean, it sounds, it, it, it sounds kind of like the Matrix, you know, with everybody all plugged in. <clears throat> okay, um, other comments? Uh, yes. Way in the back. On my way. We gotta find a better way to do this. This is really hard for Bonnie? everybody. Um, on the note of uh, people to decode something you don't recognize, mm -hmm. uh, there is a group of people out there on the internet who are who have realized you're doing that and are actually um, all using a rude word for that second word. <laughs> so they're, they're trying to get the wrong words recognized. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next comment. <laughs> can we go back to the physicist now? <laughs> uh, can, can I stop with the cynicist? Yeah. I was Sorry. just wondering what the energy efficiency was of you human beings doing the captures. <laughs> God, I don't think we ever measured that. That's a good question. But since we don't have to pay for that part, that isn't a big issue. Okay. Uh, I actually have to kind of wrap up now because yes. I have things I need to do before the end of the day. What else is funnier than this? Yeah, I'm sorry? What else is funnier than this? Yeah, okay. This is, this, thank, first of all, thank you very much for telling me, uh, or teaching me some of the things that you know that I don't. And I hope I get to come back and, and learn some more from you at another time. But in the meantime, I appreciate the excuse to be here in Australia. And I want to say that the people of Brisbane uh, and the folks who organize this conference uh, have really impressed me with their can-do ability. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. So to be very congratulated, I hope others can emulate that too. So well, thank you very thank much, you very and much. please join me.